This video is meant to be a very short introduction to anti-racist pedagogy. When I created the accessibility video, I stressed that accessibility was a very complicated topic and I was trying to cover it in a very short amount of time. This applies even more so to the topic of racism and anti-racist pedagogy. This video is meant to be an introduction to educators who care but don't know that much about anti-racist pedagogy but it will point you towards many resources from much more knowledgeable people to help you explore anti-racist pedagogy in more depth. So my guide is for online pedagogy, for teaching college courses in an online environment when we're used to teaching in person. Yet I'm creating this video because the racial tensions and protests around the country and demands for justice are going to affect us in the classroom in the fall of 2020. The increase in the profile of these protests and calls for justice have been triggered by several recent high-profile deaths caused by police or former police officers. I want to point out that currently the focus is specifically on Black Lives and Black Lives Matter movement, but it is important to note that each race has its own individual considerations that educators should become aware of in order to work towards being anti-racist educators. I want to read these three quotes from prominent 20th century social justice advocates. The first is from Elie Wiesel, who is the author of Night and a Holocaust Survivor. He wrote, We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Desmond Tutu wrote, If you are neutral on situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And in the letter Martin Luther King Jr. wrote from the Birmingham jail, he wrote, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than justice. So all three of these quotes argue that the myth of neutrality serves the oppressor rather than helping the students that we have at Lycoming College who are being hurt by individual and systemic racism. So as part of this, I would like to introduce some of the key terminology in anti-racist pedagogy. There are additional important terms to be learned, but these are meant as an introduction to the topic. The first is, what is racism? Racism is any prejudice against someone because of their race when those views are reinforced by systems of power. So the author of this quote stresses that second part of the definition of racism, that it's not racism if there is no oppression by those in power. So what is systemic racism? It is how ideas of white superiority are captured in everyday thinking at systems level, taking in the big picture of how society operates rather than looking at one-on-one -on -one interactions. These systems can include laws and regulations, but also unquestioned social systems. Systemic racism can stem from education, hiring practices, or access. The Lycoming College faculty are mostly white, and one of the first things that white people who want to become more aware of race issues need to recognize is that we grew up and were educated into systemic racism. This requires us to listen carefully to people who have a different perspective and experience than us, and perhaps question what we think we know in order to help contribute to a more just system. Another really key term is the issue of privilege. Privilege is an advantage or set of advantages that you have that others do not. Privilege can be a really touchy issue because everybody has hardships in their life due to circumstances or identities that may not have anything to do with race, but some of our identities and life situations afford us privileges that we have to be aware of if we are going to help establish more just classrooms and education systems and society. So race exists as one of many possible identity issues. Intersectionality is the belief that our social justice movements must consider all intersections of identity, privilege, and oppression that people face in order to be just and effective. So to illustrate this, I have included an identity wheel, which is often used at cultural sensitivity trainings. This allows participants to record how they identify and which aspects of their identity put them in the dominant group versus marginalized groups. The next term is microaggressions. 
Microaggressions are small daily insults and indignities perpetrated against marginalized or oppressed people because of their affiliation with that marginalized or oppressed group. The cumulative effect of these constant reminders that you are less than does real psychological damage. So some examples of microaggressions are, wow, you're so articulate, because that means that you expected them to not be articulate based on their race. Another example is, you aren't like other black people. Yet another example is, why do black people give their kids such funny names? And finally, that's so ghetto. These are just a few of many, many examples from the book So You Want to Talk About Race. And while each of these doesn't look all that serious, the point is that people of color experience these comments and actions that go along with these comments multiple times a day, every day, and psychological studies have shown that these are much more damaging to mental health than outright racism, because they not only have the indignity and the feeling of being less than from these examples of racism, but they also expend a ton of emotional and cognitive energy wondering what the intent behind these comments are and if they imagined the insult or not. Critical race theory is another important term if you decide you want to dive deep down into the theory behind racism and anti-racist pedagogy. Methodologically, CRT teaches that to understand how white supremacy operates, we need to learn from people whose everyday lived experiences are centered on dealing with racism. Analytically, it changes the notion that racism is an apparent experience and holds that instead it is endemic in our culture. It contends that any improvement that benefits people of color in a white supremacist culture only happens if white interests are served by racial justice. The next term is critical pedagogy. Pedagogy focuses on strategies, techniques, and approaches used to facilitate learning. Critical pedagogy is also interested in learning facilitation, but is primarily concerned with exposing the interests involved in the production and dissemination of knowledge. Critical pedagogy often involves constantly checking one's assumptions and asking oneself how one knows what one thinks they know and whether or not it is just. It also involves looking at power structures in the classroom, including empowering students with marginalized identities. And the last term in this video would be colorblindness. Colorblindness turns on the technical fiction of non-recognition in which individuals are asked not to see race. This is said by both liberals and conservatives for different reasons. This meme best describes why colorblindness is a problem. So when somebody is saying, I don't see race, they are trying to say that they're a good person. However, to a person of color, that means I'm going to use my place of privilege to refute and deny the sufferings of those who do not have white privilege, while at the same time erasing their personal and cultural history. So the translation given here makes it more clear why colorblindness is not something we should strive to achieve. So the next few slides are some suggested resources. I have read many of these and some of them are available at the Snowden Library as ebooks or print books. Some of them are not currently available. We are in the process of ordering. The status of these books and links to them will be available beneath this video. These two books, So You Want to Talk About Race and I'm Still Here, are written by well-known black female authors and both of them are fabulous writers who have written on difficult race topics in a way that is easy to digest. I found that because both of these authors use a lot of stories, my motivation to read them felt more like reading a novel rather than reading nonfiction. I found chapter 5 in I'm Still Here particularly powerful in which she talks about what it's like to be the only black employee in an otherwise white office and how oppressive and draining the constant microaggressions are in those offices. So here are several books and one article about race issues in higher education. And these are some excellent resources specifically on teaching race in higher education classrooms. The first two books are written by a variety of authors with various identities looking at different aspects of teaching. Teaching to Transgress is a classic by a very well-respected black author. And Kevin Kumashiro wrote this very interesting article about how no matter how dedicated we are to anti-racist and just pedagogy, because of the society we grew up in, we still commit to these repetitions, including against groups with whom 
we personally identify, but he has some suggestions for how we can continue to improve over time. And another aspect to talk about is the issue of whiteness. As members of the dominant group, which most of us are on the Lycoming faculty, our racial identity may become invisible to us. So one aspect of being an anti-racist educator is to examine our own racial identity. These are two books that look at issues of whiteness and help us clearly see whiteness when the society in which we inhabit generally makes that invisible. So this about concludes what I plan to cover in this video as a very brief introduction to anti-racist pedagogy. I have been reading about this topic for several years. The more I read about racism, being an anti-racist and just educator, the more I realize I don't know. There are no step-by-step -step directions. There is no checklist for how to be not racist. Together, I believe we can make more progress than we can if all of our efforts are individual. Being an anti-racist educator requires us to develop empathy. And I spent a lot of time thinking about empathy and realized that it has at least three parts. The first is imagination, in which we would imagine what it's like to be in the shoes of someone who is different than us. When we do this, we have to remember that we can never actually be in the shoes of someone who is different than us. We should be constantly looking for feedback of how well our imagination is lining up with another person's reality. And all of this requires a lot of motivation. Using one's imagination to place oneself in another person's shoes requires motivation, and seeking out feedback and caring about the feedback that we are given and acting upon that feedback also requires a lot of motivation. So we should engage in these activities and invest in these activities to develop our empathetic skills. And finally, this is not something that we can do overnight. However, we can look for instances where we can stand up and say, not today. This image was to illustrate something that I read in a book that touched me. This is from Rachel Held Evans' book called Inspired, where she writes, On a muggy June morning in South Carolina, a young black woman named Bree Newsom scaled the 30-foot flagpole outside the state's Capitol building, looked straight into the eyes of the beast, and said, Not today. So as we work towards being anti-racist educators, we can look for instances which may seem small and insignificant at a time where we can stand up and say, not today, not here, not now. Thank you for watching this video.